A.T. Still was the founder of osteopathy and A.T. Still liked to say that everything is important and everything is connected. And what he means by this is that there are no systems in the body and there's no tissue that's more important than other tissue. We often tend to think that maybe someone comes in with a breathing stress, that maybe the lungs and the breathing mechanism surely must be more important than say something in a joint. But from the body's point of view, this is not true. If there's any strain, severe strain in the leg, the body's almost ready to uh, have a conflict at the ankle or the knee. From the body's point of view, if it can't run away from danger, that might be what the general listing shows you the day that they're in the session. So every tissue is important because the other uh, saying in osteopathy from AT still, every tissue deserves circulation. So with that, it's never our choice where to treat a person if we leave it up to the body. And we call this the listening. And the listening is accessing with our hands the cellular intelligence to direct us. Everything is connected simply means that all tissue is contiguous. So if you have a lesion in one part of the sweater, if I did, I'm going to have an effect on another part of the sweater. Similarly, when we act on one part of the body, if we try to come in with our hands and make a change, we can have an effect on another part of the body. So this is always to be kept in mind. And everything is connected also means that sometimes, especially with the NM work, I have had lots of times that these say on the right tentorium and the person will say, oh, I'm feeling that old injury in my right knee uh, that I haven't felt since I was 16, you know, when I went skiing one day. So it's quite interesting that way when we're on the neuromeninges, especially, uh, we're on the whole history of that tissue. So that's uh, sometimes and very often you have symptoms that are at different time frames in the history of the body and certainly at different location from where we place our hands. The um, Pons cord track is something, the anatomy that we teach in the NM1, and that's um, the description of the nervous system anatomy that the, um, the Swedish surgeon Alf Brigg termed the Pons cord track, in that what that means is that the top of the spinal cord is not the frenum magnum as we sometimes are tempted like just visually to think, it's actually the meninges, but they of course join bregma. So it's a whole continuum, the central gyra that surrounds the brain and spinal cord, one, one uh, continuum. But there is no real separation between that vertical, what we call the central nervous system and the transverse organization through the plexus to the upper and lower extremity. And we learn in NM1 that if you have a, a, a pull on one of the plexus, that you want to release that tethering. And the whole focus is to get the balance back in the, in the, in the brain and the spinal cord. But there are more things uh, that influence the brain and spinal cord than just the neuromeninges. You know, you can still go and I'll get invitations to conventions that are about the spine and it's just going to be four days about the spine. It's presented like the holy grail as if there's nothing attached to the human spine. But of course, that's not the real picture. There are no systems in the body. They're all very interactive. So the brain and spinal cord are one unit and that's how sciatica can give you a headache, for example. But as well, you have the visceral sheaths that attach to the cranial base. And more, <clears throat> keep in mind that the visceral sheath begins at the perineum. So from the perineum, you have the endopelvic fascia coming through the abdomen, the thoracic cavity and the cervical cavity, and all attaching just in front of foramen magnum to both temporal bones, the sphenoid and the occiput. So in the textbook, <clears throat> sorry that the book, the required reading for this class that some of you have read through, you have a whole section on the organs and the visceral um, that, that attach through the visceral system <clears throat> um, and that are affected in a trauma. So the body has no, does not specialize. And as therapists, we have to consider, um, you can't just be an NM therapist or a visceral therapist or even like a spinal therapist. You have kind of to know a little bit about everything. So with that, 
Um, if you we remember, and just to take um, a little bit of the reminding the physiology, if you take your arm, and those of you standing up or sitting down, just like I'm doing now, I extend my arm, I take it beyond the mid-axillary line, I then ex extend my wrist, I take my head side bend away from that side and rotate, I should be able to get the full end range without any pain. There should be pain-free movement in that, uh, in that arm movement. If you did that and you had experienced some pain or motion barrier that you couldn't do that complete movement, then you have a restriction somewhere in the neuromeninges system. And very often, uh, the musculoskeletal system, <clears throat> we come in, for example, if someone has uh, neck pain on that side, we come in with our musculus muscle uh, techniques and we don't make a big change. What we say in, um, in the neuromeninges program is that muscle uh, protect nerve and muscle protect the dura. So if you have uh, a tension on that whole side of the pons cord track, it will re the body will try to um, bring in the muscle system to put some extra tension on the paravertebral muscles of that side so that you don't injure your neck doing some movement. So oftentimes when there's um, the body resists a movement, it's bringing in the muscle to protect uh, the jira. And Lisa gave a really good example, a description of that last week. The jira major has her own uh, supply of nerves that tell the brain uh, what's the condition of the jira. So you have the recurrent meningeal nerve that say in the cervical spine is gonna exit the, nerve, the cervical foramen. Then it's gonna double back in the recurrent. It's gonna recur back toward the spinal cord. And so the recurrent meningeal nerve is actually monitoring the sensitivity of the jira and telling the brain if there's a tension on the jira and the brain in response says, well, we wouldn't want to damage it. So we're going to put hypertonicity in the paravertebral segments and maybe even lock the spinal segment. And so oftentimes, um, you'll notice that after releasing the neuromeninges that the muscle cell down on itself, by itself. So um, when we, um, let's see what else is there. So the nervous system of, of the, the neuromeninges is very often involved in trauma of all kinds. And so the textbook, um, when I first took this class, there's no called NM1, it was outright called uh, Trauma and Whiplash by Jean-Pierre. And so in the book, there's a lot of research on what happens with what are called inertia trauma. So just to review, there's two kinds of trauma, mechanical trauma we're talking about. One is called contact trauma and one is called inertia trauma. So with contact trauma, you run into something or something runs into you. And with contact trauma, let's say you fall off your chair onto the grass, the muscle will come in to defend you. You might bruise your leg a little bit. If you fell off a tree not to, and onto the grass, maybe the muscle uh, protect and the ligaments come in and also into some uh, to protect you from that um, fall. If you fell off your bicycle and onto a harder surface, like you fall off your bike and onto the sidewalk, the duration of the impact, remember, is a lot faster than if you fall onto the soft grass and you might break a bone. But in a way, you bruise your thigh, you have ligamentous tension and you break a bone, the body absorbs some of that incoming kinetic energy and disperses it a little bit. And uh, when, however, the impact happens at a speed that breaches those defenses, there isn't time for the body to do any of that, then that duramater, the peritoneum, and the pleura, the connective tissue, is what comes in to protect. This is very much what happens with inertia trauma, as we describe in NM1. You don't have to hit anything to have inertia trauma and to have trauma on the neuromeninges. So when you have a change in the speed at which the body's going and then you suddenly stop, it's the fluids 
that register, that change in velocity. So just think of it as when you go up and down in an elevator, your bones and your muscles could care less. They're quite happy to go up and down, but your fluids feel a little uneasy because they're increasing in weight as the body moves. So when the elevator goes up, all the blood and the weight increases in the lower body. And when the elevator goes down, it's the reverse. The problem arises is when that comes to a sudden stop. And when there's a sudden stop, that increase in weight of the liver and of the brain, for example, is transferred to the connective tissue bridges that moor the organs to the musculoskeletal system and moor the brain to the um, bones of the skull. The legacy of that is that you have less resiliency and you have more tissue density in the connective tissue that surrounds and supports brain and spinal cord. And we feel this with our hands as increased density. So when we're doing our listening, for evaluation, we're always considering going to the place that has lost uh, resiliency. And curiously enough, as we said, bruise is obvious, broken bone is obvious, but these tensions don't show up on an x-ray, they don't show up on a CT, they don't show up on an MRI, and yet the patients can feel worse and worse with the years and nobody knows why, but we can find them with our hands. So symptoms tend to arise when the ability of the body to compensate has been used up. And so often there's quite a legacy and a history in the person. Neuromeninges can have, lose elasticity with any kind of infection, certainly with epidural, with spinal tap, you have disc problem affects the spinal dura, you have, a, you, you have a collision, you have a concussion, you have a whiplash, and each time there's an incident, you have a little bit, it's like you have a little bit less room in the system. So it's important not to judge patients when they come. Some people, they do some small little thing and then they don't feel right. They have all kinds of uh, aches, pains, and uh, mysterious symptoms. Because you must always consider the pre-lesional state of the patient. So that's this condition they were in before they had the incident. So to take a little example, you could have a quiet librarian who hasn't had no, played no sports as a girl and has had no a uh, particular, um, uh, what's a sort of mechanical insult uh, to her body. And she's driving along and nevertheless, she decides to hit a tree, right? Anyway, she hits a tree. And she'll get out of her car and she'll feel a little bit dazed, but she'll be sort of okay and probably go back to work by the, you know, in a day or two. You could have patient number two, separate person, and they had they fell off their bike at age six and then they had with their first child an epidural and then maybe they had also a cesarean they had a history of bronchitis and then maybe even they had some gastroenteritis any kind of infection in the body anywhere lays down adhesions it creates dry tethered uh, tissue density there's that same person going 40 kilometers an hour hitting the same tree is not going to have the ability, the tissues will have not had the same ability to disperse that incoming uh, force and they'll probably go to the hospital and they then would require a lot more treatment. So you can never judge a patient by what was the last incident because there was often a whole history. The body has very good memory, much better than ours, and it remembers everything. <laughs>